very warm welcome to this 15th episode of the Moments of Grace. This one entitled Graceful Times with Father Caleb. Welcome, Father Caleb. Thank you, Father Rice. It's good, good to be here. Good to see you again. Our second Moments of Grace together. I'm going all the way back to our Christmas carol singing, which yeah. was a big hit for Moments of Grace. It's great to have you back with us. Good to be here. Not for much longer, but I'm here now. Well, that is why we have you on here today. Not for much longer, indeed. As many of you will know, uh, Father Caleb is moving on to another parish, July the 4th being his final Sunday here at Grace. Father Caleb came to Grace in November of 2014, so almost seven years of graceful knowledge built up uh, with Father Caleb, uh, all that he's given us, and I'm sure all that Grace has given him as well. But as I mentioned, July 4th, his final Sunday, off to St. Paul's in Wilmington, North Carolina. A little bit like a homecoming, yeah? Absolutely. We're excited. But we're also, uh, you know, Grace is such a wonderful place. It's bittersweet. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, and our interviewer today is going to be our Director of Communications, Chris Prohaska. Chris, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Chris yeah, you can't be on this podcast without having a beard. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Chris had this excellent idea for our June Moments of Grace to be a little bit of a, for lack of better words, an exit interview with you, Father Caleb. So I'm going to throw it over to Chris and let him roll. Sure. I would be honored. Now, Bryce obviously brought me on to ask the hard-hitting questions here. So let's just get right into it, Caleb. What makes your cooking so good? And how are we going to get some for staff lunches going forward for Grace to you? Grace to go. Yeah, that, you know, uh, Grace is a little bit like Hotel California. You can check <laughs> out any time you want, but you can never leave. So who knows what kind of surprise appearances you might have on the Grace, uh, the Grace Pig Cooker uh, in future times. But, you know, I've been a long time cook. Uh, my mother uh, is kind of like Miss Kathy here. Her, her ministry is hospitality and food and making people um, feel feel good through through food. Uh, food is what binds. Um, I just got back from vacation uh, and uh, with my family and my extended family and each night one of the children, the adult children and their spouse uh, ch cooks for the family and it's usually this competition almost about who, who, who can cook the best thing. You know I, I worked in, uh, in in restaurants throughout high school and college and it's always just um, been part of who I am. And I used to, you know, tailgate, I used to be the head chef at the tailgates at NC State football games. And naturally that bleeds over into ministry then, but really now. But the real thing is that you all have the grill and I think Kathy's doing a fine job. And I have talked to a few folks at Grace who know a thing or two about barbecue. We just have to make sure Nick, who uh, is proud of to be an East Carolinian, that we got to kind of maybe uh, raise him up to to, to, do, to do the grill next. You took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say, I, I hope that Nick has been paying attention over the last uh, two or three years so that uh, he can carry on the mantle. <laughs> Very good. Speaking of Nick and um, his role in the youth, that's obviously also been a huge focus of yours since you started at Grace. And so I was curious, um, with all of your time working with the youth here, I'm sure that, and I know that you have taught them a lot, but that street sort of goes both ways. So I'm curious to know what you would say that they've taught you. Wow, that's a good question. That's a great question. Hmm. Well, I've learned that I always have to be on my feet with young people. And, you know, I've discovered that I'm old, which <laughs> is always good to have younger people. You know, first it was Christian. Uh, and, and now Nick, who's doing a fine job, and he's actually brought on somebody new and George. And so it's, it's a consistent kind of reworking uh, of, of, of newness with kids. Um, but it's also about consistency. Kids need to know that we're there for them. But more than that, uh, we, the consistency has to be there with the age old message of grace. Uh, the youth group may ebb and flow and may change and people, kids will graduate and leaders will move to something else. But the, the age old message of grace, that consistent message is what's most important. And kids are no different than adults, just perhaps a bit more open to that message. 
<laughs> Absolutely. The way, the way I was taught to work with youth is not with a traditional classroom style, but uh, with relationship and in relationship. And kids typically are drawn towards relationship. It's important to create experiences with kids, not just um, in a classroom settings. Um, confirmation is, uh, class is so much more um, meaningful when you're involved in the groups and the relationships and experiences that go along with youth at Grace, like Glory Ridge, pilgrimages, happening, which we developed through my time here. We started that in the diocese. Lock-ins, all these experiences bind us together in Christian relationship. And kids are drawn to authenticity and depth. And so our program offers a lot of opportunity for journaling and reflection as well as sharing on that reflection. And that's where I've learned the most about, uh, about our kids and about that they're no different than adults, uh, that we all, um, that I, we, we're all broken human individuals. Um, I've learned that the brokenness of the human condition is not spared on the youth of our church but neither is God's grace. I've seen ugly ducklings turn into beautiful swans. Um, I've learned that God is in the business of redemption with all of us, and I certainly appreciate this as a parent uh, in working not only with the youth, but with the kids, because as we all know, parenting doesn't come with an instruction book. And I'm still learning how to be a parent. So it's one of those things I preached at Christian Basil's ordination the other day, the, the parent, I mean, the child often raises the parent and the student often raises the teacher. So it's, right. a, it's a two-way street in relationship. I, uh, I think that mutual relationship there was, was especially on full display recently when we recognized the, uh, the graduating seniors. And I know that class was especially special to you because I think those were uh, some of the first kids that you worked with when you got here. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And I, you know, as someone who was there, it was, I could tell on both sides, you know, the kids, obviously, the youth, the young adults, I guess now, um, you know, very clearly had that relationship with you. And, um, and I, I thought I saw a, an emotional, uh, emotional face on, on you as well. So. Never with me, Chris. Are you kidding me? I'm the no. smartest person in the world. <laughs> Must have been a different guy. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of uh, graduating this year and sort of, you know, thinking about how different this year has been for students and for everyone really. Um, that has not been exclusive to the youth. Um, you have also been very busy with not just COVID related things, but also um, as the head of the standing committee. And my question for you now is that how have the responsibilities and challenges of last year, be it through the pandemic, through your extra roles in the standing committee, or just in general, everything that's gone on, um, what lessons would you take away from what you've gathered in the last year uh, going forward? Well, I think that it has certainly uh, allowed me to trust the call process. Um, it's allowed me to trust my own sense of call. I knew that when I was being considered for election a year and a half ago as president of the standing committee, that I felt called to it because I knew that I had the necessary and God-given gifts to get the diocese through a bishop election process. I never knew what else would be thrown our way in the midst of it, but in some ways the COVID crisis slowed things down at a good time for our diocese. Operating without a bishop was challenging, but in some ways COVID allowed for some of the things that would have brought more stress to the system to disappear. Um, being president of the standing committee during such a unique time has been challenging for sure. And I recently got an email uh, of, of someone who, who's been following with us um, in this process as he heard that I was being called away from the diocese. He, he, I sincerely respect him in ministry. And he said, he said that I was given a battlefield commission uh, in addition to all of the unusual aspects as president of the standing committee, the COVID crisis added a unique dynamic to all that came under the auspices of, quote, ecclesiastical authority, unquote. And I certainly developed more gray hairs this past year and a half. But I don't think that that is just me. I think we all have. I've, heard, I've learned an unbelievable amount about leadership and the benefits and drawbacks of committee work compromise, consensus, and staying in relationship with people, even when there is uh, conflict and significant disagreement. 
My position as president has prepared me for being a rector, I, I hope. And I have also had a deep dive into the canons of the church, uh, how important it is to work under the authority of the Constitution and canons. And I've been called a canon nerd a time or two. Uh, but I'm also aware, and we all must be aware, that the canons or rules in general can stymie and uh, they can stymie creativity and keep us all in the weeds. And there has to be a balance between order and room for creativity. If we totally live by the canons or by the rules, then it is hard for ministry to happen. But we also need governance to keep us within the guardrails. I remember Jesus saying the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the same goes with the canons. The canons were made for the church, not the church for the canons. More than anything, I have learned that you cannot govern by committee. You cannot lead by committee. We need a bishop. We elected one. My work is done. It is a good stopping point. <laughs> Well, I, I think I speak for everyone when I say we're definitely thankful for, for you for your role in that. And uh, I, I almost feel like I hear a, a slight sound of relief in your voice as you say it's finished. <laughs> so I know we, um, we're very excited about what the future holds and thank you for your role in that. Yeah. Sort of switching gears here. Um, I wanted to focus a little bit on the musical elements that people might be familiar with that you often integrate as well. Um, in addition to the fact that you often just canter here at Grace, you also find a way to integrate music into your sermons from time to time. And friend of yours, friends of yours on social media might have seen you posting, especially during the pandemic, some very fun videos of you making music. And I say fun, not in a, in a bad way. I mean, they were great. It was fantastic. And I think very uplifting for us at that time where um, it was a great opportunity to help us continue to feel connected. Um, but could you sort of delve into that a little bit more and say um, if you think music is an important part of your spirituality personally, and if so, why do you think it resonates with you so much? Yeah, um, good question. I'm going to have to delve a little deep to, to get there, but uh, just to give you some background, but music is certainly an integral part of my life and thus my spirituality. In every period of my life, uh, music has been present. I mean, I remember singing in the Little Angels Choir at uh, my home church as a child. My mother uh, led that choir. Um, you know, in middle school, I was started performing in musicals. And uh, I spent a lot of time in middle school on the side of my bed figuring out the guitar chords in Nirvana and Green Day. <laughs> uh, and my family, they were called the Von Traps at church because one pew full of full of kids and parents, we would take up the whole pew and this one pew would be singing four part harmony to all the hymns. <laughs> uh, this intensified in high school while at boarding school, I would regularly play the guitar and sing in chapel and the school choir. And I kept doing musicals. And even this is a fun fact that you won't know about Father Caleb. Uh, I even sang in the local high school junior miss pageants as entertainment between the different rounds of, uh, you know, uh, different things that the young the young women would do. And uh, my freshman year at NC State, I sang in the Glee Club, but then quit so I could focus on rock and roll. <laughs> and uh, was in a couple of bands, but always felt more creative and comfortable as a solo act. And I, uh, I hosted an open mic for a few years uh, at a place called Ruckus Bar and Grill. And I would always fill in uh, while when there were no acts there. So I developed this repertoire and that ended up pushing me into uh, summer, summer gigs at dives around places like Topsail Beach. And after college, I was immersed in youth ministry and took all those musical experiences and funneled them into both modern and traditional praise music, uh, leading, leading kids, uh, leading youth group um, as an adult, leading youth groups, accompanying them, uh, playing music for them and with them on experiences like Glory Ridge and Happening. And now I'm channeling a different side of Caleb, one who has fallen back in love with a more traditional side of church music. And I wouldn't say I'd never fell out of love with it. It just wasn't a focus necessarily. It was on Sundays. Sure. But I was so involved with the kids um, that, 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 that the other fell to the wayside. I love all of the music in the church, literally. Traditional camp music, praise music, gospel music, you name it. I love it. And, 
folks over here on this side of the church, me in the parish hall, can hear me coming because I tend to whistle. <laughs> and I realized I didn't whistle very much over the past year and a half, uh, which is an interesting insight. Um, but I did use music in an evangelical way. I used this past year and a half to learn how to fake the piano fairly well. And during the really tough parts of the pandemic, uh, you mentioned this earlier, Chris, I posted several videos of myself singing songs on the piano and offering some commentary on how these songs point to God's grace. It was cathartic for me and apparently helpful for many folks. And that's kind of where I wanted to end, end this, is just to say what's cathartic for me, singing and music, um, I've discovered is helpful for other people. And the best thing about, about this is that, and about the experience of last, uh, this past year and a half on social media is that it's, it was totally organic and not forced at all. It came up out of me and I hope it helped others. And that is what music is at its best. I, I think it's safe to say it did based off of some of the, the comments I saw and, and the feedback and all of that. So I know I certainly uh, enjoyed it. And when even us in the office weren't able to see each other as much, it was a, a nice, nice reminder of uh, we're, we're all still connected no matter what and in a very unique way. So I thank you for it, as I'm sure I speak on behalf of the whole parish. And uh, speaking of the parish, um, I just sort of wanted to wrap up with um, giving you the floor and saying if there's any sort of last comments or anything like that that you'd like to say to to the good folks here at Grace or anyone else watching, um, we'd love to hear it. Uh, thanks, Chris. You might hear VBS going on downstairs. Uh, there's a little bit of muffle from the from the parrot puppet that's going on. I think his name is Beacon. Um, um, but anyway, I will say that um, to the parish, two words, thank you. You are an amazing parish, cathedral. You are generous and kind. You have been the body of Christ. You have made me a better priest and have prepared me for my next step in ministry. And I hope and pray I have given you just an ounce of, uh, of what you have given me, of what I've re received from being a part of the community of grace. And I pray that in my time here, I've helped make youth ministry sustainable for years to come and done my part in helping God rebuild the Diocese of South Carolina. But most importantly, the, uh, my experience with you, Sunday, in Sunday after Sunday after Sunday of unbelievable liturgy and music and sermons, uh, you've, you've formed my family in the faith and have taught me and my family about the grace of God, about God's grace and what it means so thanks to Michael and all the clergy, wardens, vestry, staff, and people of grace. You are all people of grace. You truly live into your name. Keep it up. And come see me up in Wilmington sometime. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I know I we know we will all miss you very much, but we also are very confident that you will do great things, and we can't wait to hear about them. Awesome. Awesome. Me, I can't wait to do them. <laughs> well, thank you guys very much. I just wanted to one or two things quickly at the end. Did, did I hear that you used to sing at beauty pageants? I did. I did. How, how has that revelation stayed secret these almost seven years and only <laughs> comes out at this point? You know, some things that just are too too good to be shared immediately. They take time to, to come out of them. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure he'll send us links for us to put in the description below. Don't worry. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, I think you have chosen probably the right time to reveal that. But as I close, it's very interesting that you mentioned something else. Do you know what I've noticed walking out of midweek services near you over the last few weeks? Whistling. Yes. It's bad. I was wondering where that was coming from. Yep. Yep. And it was you whistling along. Well, that's, that's, that's a wonderful thing uh, to place the whistle to the whistler, but also a wonderful thing to hear um, because... <clears throat> It kind of captures what you've been for me here at Grace in my two and a half years here. You've always been an excellent support. You've always been somebody that I know I can go to. You've always either shoot you a text or a phone call uh, to help me out, to help me find my way, and to give me the support that I've needed. So I appreciate that very much. I'm sure you've been that for many, many people here at Grace, not just for me. Um, and so I appreciate that so much. And I think we all thank you for that as well. 
You're welcome. And I'm sure here in the coming weeks, months, and years, we can have a few more moments of grace together, even though you'll be in Wilmington. Oh, that'll be fun. All right. Well, thank you, Chris, for being with us today. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Father Caleb, thank you for being with us. And all of the blessings and prayers that we can possibly send your way are going with you as you leave us on July the 4th. Yeah, thank you. God bless you. God bless Grace Church Cathedral. Until next time, thanks you all for being with us.